I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly wide ranging interview. Pope Francis sits down with the Associated Press where he reiterates church teaching on homosexuality, violating the FACE Act, why a priest who is a well known pro life advocate is facing one year in prison, bloodshed in Haiti, an update on the worsening conditions in the Caribbean nation, and Catholic diplomat. Meet the new ambassador from South Korea to the Holy See. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on this feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Our top story tonight, the opening arguments in the trial of a pro-life father of seven began today in Philadelphia. Mark Houck is facing federal charges after he allegedly assaulted a Planned Parenthood volunteer outside of an abortion clinic today in court. Houck's lawyer said that he pushed the man after the man verbally assaulted one of his sons. The prosecution had said that Houck targeted the volunteer. A Catholic priest who blocked access to a Planned Parenthood abortion clinic last year has been found guilty of violating the FACE Act. Father Fidelis Mochinski says that he put locks and chains on, on the entrance to the clinic on Long Island so he would have time to talk to the mothers attempting to enter. He effectively shut down the clinic for two hours. Yesterday in New York, he was found guilty of violating the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act if convicted. He faces one year in prison. His sentencing is set for late April. Well, the Department of Justice has indicted two pro-abortion activists for attacking and threatening pro-life pregnancy centers in Florida. According to NBC News, a 27-year-old and 23-year-old vandalized facilities, including the Archdiocese of Miami Office of Respect for Life. They spray-painted threatening language on the building. The two face up to 12 years in prison. Our more than 2,000 rabbis say they want to set the record straight about Jewish law and abortion. This in the wake of statements from some rabbis and Jewish leaders that abortion is permitted under Jewish law and that safeguarding the right to an abortion is an obligation. Joining us tonight to help us sort all of this out is Rabbi Yaakov Menken, Managing Director of the Coalition for Jewish Values. Rabbi, great to see you as always. Um, this whole controversy centers around a law in the state of Missouri, the Right to Life of the Unborn Child Act. Tell us why some rabbis took issue with this measure and what do they do about it? Well, five rabbis joined a total of 12 clergy suing to block the law, claiming that it is promoting a particularist sect uh, limited view. And of course, that is fundamentally wrong. This is not a Christian issue. This is a values issue. This is common American values that all of America was founded on the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The idea that a an abortion which affects another person. And by the way, is, we're not talking here about mandatory medical care. The law specifically has a carve out for a medical emergency where the mother's life is at risk. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about elective abortion. And the idea that something which is, well, it's an elective abortion, is somehow a religious obligation. It's not just that what they're saying is completely against Judaism, but frankly, it's against common sense. Yeah, and how did that idea get out there, Rabbi? And it's often repeated. It's coming from a particular leftist group within the Jewish community that has really eliminated their Jewish values. The reform movement started off. I mean, let's understand you know, the deeper issue here is that the reform movement adopted progressivism as its religious value. They said, we're going to forget about the Talmud and everything that makes Judaism Judaism, and we're going to just remember some of those holidays, and we're going to add to it unlimited development which is the 19 which is the excuse me the 1844 german equivalent of progressivism progressivism is their religion and their religious value so they don't believe that observing our sabbath is a jewish value or that observing kosher is a jewish value but oh no having access to an abortion that's a jewish value mm, unbelievable well you know as we mentioned you and 2000 other jewish rabbis also spoke out about this argument that a pro life position places religion over science uh, what do you have to say about that 
Well, it, it's first of all, everything that we have learned about a baby since Roe v. Wade was decided, and that was in the 1970s. We've come a long way since the 1970s. We now know that a baby sucks his thumb, listens to his parents' voices, learns his parents' voices, gravitates to his parents' voices, and even learns nursery music in the womb, in utero. So the idea that that fetus is not alive has nothing to do with science. It's, yeah. So therefore, it's not a religious issue. Again, it's just a common basic values issue that there are two lives at stake here. Yeah, Rabbi, I'm curious, what kind of effect do you think these dissenting viewpoints uh, and mixed messages have on your flock? Well, um, you know, our flock in the observant Orthodox community it understands where our values are. The problem is that a lot of people, especially across America, are very concerned about what is the Jewish view and what could be construed as discriminatory against Jews. They actually have claimed that somehow being pro-life is insensitive to the Jewish community. And we have to set the record straight on that. And that's why it is so important that our organization make statements on that because we, we can't have that in America. It cannot be there's so much real anti-Semitism going on, we can't have a distraction like that, claiming it's somehow insensitive to the Jewish community to be pro-life. Oh, no, that's our values. We're on board. Oh, Rabbi, great to have you on, as always, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Our first, it was former President Donald Trump and then President Joe Biden, and now former Vice President Mike Pence. Each one had classified documents where they shouldn't have been and secured inside their homes, offices, and even garages. It clearly points to a breakdown in protecting sensitive information. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric? Well, I tell you what, Tracy, you almost need a program to be able to follow this up here on Capitol Hill. But lawmakers tell me congressional hearings are already being planned to look deeper into how in the world this could happen. Republicans do point out that unlike President, uh, former President Trump and even former Vice President Mike Pence, that most of the classified documents found in Joe Biden's home were, in fact, when he was a senator. And current senators I spoke with say there's no way that this should have happened. You've looked at classified documents and skiffs before. Yeah. How in the world could these get out? I don't like know. That? I, it's real, I don't know the answer to that. I, that's what really puzzles me. As a member of several committees, Senator Josh Hawley has handled classified documents inside safe rooms. I don't know how you would get it out of there unless you. I suppose you could put it in a briefcase. And are and you allowed briefcases inside? No, no, not allowed anything. I, you know, if I'm wearing an Apple Watch, I got to take it off. I, I, I never knew it was possible to take classified documents out of the skiff. So I don't, most of us don't think there's any way of getting it out of the skiff, much less bringing it to your office or taking it home. Even senior Democrats are dismayed by a steady stream of startling disclosures. Let's be honest about it. Uh, when that information is found, it diminishes uh, the stature of any person who is in possession of it because it's not supposed to happen. Despite the criticism, Democrats are defending President Biden, who they say is cooperating with the Justice Department. The president has to walk a difficult line here. People may not appreciate it, but there's an ongoing investigation. He wants it to reach a conclusion without any appearance of improper influence that might result from more public statements. But Speaker Kevin McCarthy says the president has some explaining to do. And I don't think the president can sit back and continue to say, you know, they're secure and I don't know who's been to the house. We know those documents are around and we'll have to get to the bottom of that. By the way, Congressman James Comer, chair of the House Oversight Committee, tells me that the National Archives did not meet a January 24th deadline to turn over documents that were found inside of President Biden's home. Some of lawmakers have even uh, brought up the idea that maybe the archives should not be in charge of any more classified documents. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is rejecting two Democrats from serving on the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman Eric Swalwell and former chairman of the panel Adam Schiff are out this after an attempt by the minority party to place them on the committee. Eric Swalwell would be in the private sector and can't get a security clearance there. We are not going to provide him with the secrets to America. Hakeem Jeffrey has 200 other people who can, who can serve on that committee. 
This is the right of the speaker. And the one thing I will always do, I will put the national security ahead of partisan politics any day. Speaker, Speaker McCarthy says Swalwell's alleged relationship with the Chinese spy and Schiff's abuse of power in the Russia collusion probe against former President Trump is enough to remove them both. Democrats call the move political vengeance. Our President Joe Biden announces more firepower is on the way to Ukraine. He is sending U.S. tanks to counter Russian forces before they launch a possible spring offensive. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, Ukraine has urgently requested M1 Abrams tanks from the United States, and now those tanks have gotten the green light. And Germany will provide Ukraine with Leopard 2 battle tanks. And the Kremlin calls it all a disastrous plan and warns the tanks will burn. With Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin behind him, President Joe Biden steps up to the microphone. Today I'm announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. The announcement reversing months of persistent arguments that the tanks are too difficult for Ukrainian troops to operate and maintain. Secretary Austin has recommended this step because it will enhance the Ukraine's capacity to defend its territory and achieve its strategic objectives. As for concerns, the move will add more fuel to the fire. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby says... And as the president said, they don't represent an offensive threat to Russia. Do they represent a threat to Russian soldiers? You bet they do. But not to Russian soldiers that are in Ukraine, not, not, to, uh, not to Russia proper. Meanwhile, the doomsday clock. Planet Earth has never been this close to Armageddon, now just a minute and a half before midnight. That's according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, who point to several threats, including Russian leader Vladimir Putin's words and actions. His troops left the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut in ruins. The city in the east of the country has been the epicenter of the fighting in recent months. This is about freedom. Freedom for Ukraine. Freedom everywhere. It's about the kind of world we want to live in, the world we want to leave to our children. And this morning, President Biden spoke with NATO allies about Ukraine. He said the U.S. and Europe are fully, thoroughly, totally united. Also, the White House says it has seen no indication that President Putin has any intention of using weapons of mass destruction, adding Putin could end the war in Ukraine today. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. In the meantime, Russia says its warships are conducting drills in parts of the Atlantic Ocean. The Kremlin says that it is doing a computer simulation of hypersonic missiles. During the electronic test, the missile hit a sea target more than 500 miles away. Well, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including cause for concern. A report from Haiti amid unprecedented violence in the Caribbean nation and wide ranging interview. What the Holy Father said to the Associated Press that has people taking notice. back tonight. The UN reports gang violence is spiraling out of control in Haiti at a level not seen in decades. The number of reported killings soared by 35 percent last year and kidnappings more than doubled this as the nation lost the few remaining elected officials it had. The Associated Press reports the United Nations will not get help from the United States or Canada to combat the violence in Haiti. And in a statement yesterday, Canada's U.N. ambassador said future solutions must be led by Haitians and by Haitian institutions. And joining us tonight from Haiti is Frederic Jean-Baptiste, Child Protection Program Manager for Catholic Relief Services in Haiti. Frederick, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it sounds like such a devastating situation down there. What more can you tell us, and what are you seeing? Well, thank you. So, yes, Haiti is experiencing a rather difficult, turbulent um, period of social unrest. Um, most recently, we had two months where we are not able to go to the office, schools were closed. Um, difficult finding fuel for our cars, um, and doubling on that is the resurgence of cholera. Uh, but there is emergency response activities on the ground, but it's not. It's a difficult context, yes, for sure. 
Yeah, and I know that you work with orphans. What impact is this crisis having on these especially vulnerable children and families in Haiti? That is the thing. So um, I, the initiative I work with, Changing the Way We Care, which is an initiative between um, CRS, Catholic Relief Services, and Marishful, we work with orphanages, um, uh, with orphanages in um, working towards changing the way they care, so children can be can be raised in families. And how we're doing that is, we know that with orphanages, more than 80% of the children there, they're not orphans. They have families who are open to receive them and care for them if they have the appropriate resources. Yeah, and I know, um, you know, if this current situation were enough, I mean, we're talking about really the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, where much of the infrastructure, well, that was destroyed 13 years ago in an earthquake, it, and the orphanages there have really been stretched thin. Um, I hate to think of what things are life right, like there right now in the orphanages. Um, can you just give us a little more sense of what these little children uh, are experiencing? Right. So after the earthquake in 2010, which um, we've, we just, it's been 13 years now, um, after the earthquake of 2010, we saw a boom in orphanages, about 150% increase. And what we know is that at that time, they were providing key support, but since then, it's been difficult and they're not often meeting the, the target in centers of care, but it still remains as a pull factor from, for, for some families who at times they feel they cannot provide three meals a day, for example, or access to health care or access to education. So it is that is where the initiative comes in and in supporting because we know children thrive in families and their bright futures and it begins with loving families and not often in orphanages. Um, so that is where our work comes in, in supporting orphanages, in transitioning, in working with families as well to connect them to key, resource, key resources so they do not feel um, the need to separate, to make this heart-wrenching decision in separating with their children. And Frederick, before I let you go, um, what else would you like folks to know about what's happening in Haiti? And also, what can we do uh, to help these struggling families? Um, so for, I think this is one key thing, and that, that is the key message I would like to share, is that um, we know that in the past we've all, uh, we've tried to answer with the most generosity towards vulnerable children, but we want to make sure that those who are providing support, they can provide support to residential care, if they're working with residential care facilities or orphanages, that they start having this conversation in connecting um, in orphanages, starting this connection with families, so they can start this support towards having children going back home, making sure that they stay in touch with their families. And we want to also make sure that, um, so orphanages know in the folks, they start pushing so that the orphanages can make can find the resources possible for to to reintegrate families. So that is what the key the key message would be for um, for me today in changing the way we care. Frederick, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you for what you do. God bless you. Thank you. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, message from the Holy Father, why Pope Francis says we should be excited for the start of every day. Plus, Meet South Korea's first female ambassador to the Holy See. Pope Francis says being homosexual is not a crime, but he reiterated church teaching that homosexual acts are sinful. That was part of a wide-ranging interview released earlier today by the Associated Press. The Holy Father also said that he felt as if he had, quote, lost his father following the death of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. In terms of the Holy Father's health, Pope Francis said that his intestinal problems have returned, but overall, the 86-year-old considers himself in good condition. Pope Francis tells the faithful that for those who follow Christ, each day is a time of grace and a new opportunity. At his weekly talk at the Vatican, the Holy Father says God forgets everything when we approach him asking forgiveness. He also urged the faithful to turn to Christ when we have problems because we are not self-sufficient and Jesus will always help us 
regardless of our circumstances. Well, finally tonight, South Korea has a new ambassador to the Holy See. Ambassador Hyun Juo comes to the Vatican from the United Nations in New York. She is South Korea's first female ambassador to the Holy See. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser had the opportunity to speak with her. We're here in Rome in front of St. Peter's and with me is the new ambassador to the Holy See from the Republic of Korea. Thank you so much for being with us and I understand you just presented your credentials to the Holy Father. How was that? Thank you for having me first and then um, uh, I just want to uh, say um, the Happy New Year to you. <laughs> we Koreans uh, celebrate a new Lunar New Year and it falls on the last Sunday. So, so Happy New Year to you as well. Thank then. you. And um, it was the very the first um, the encounter in person with the Pope, the Holy Father. And um, it's certainly a memorable moment in my life as a Catholic and also um, in my career as a diplomat. And um, he um, genuinely um, greeted um, my family, my staff members, and myself with a very warm heart and um, the big smiles <laughs> and um, encouragement a lot. So for you, what, what will be the next steps here also as an ambassador? What hope do you hope to achieve being here in Rome, being also sent to the Vatican? We are preparing uh, uh, several commemorative events um, uh, in cooperation with the uh, Korean Catholic Church. So I'd like to um, contribute to strengthening and deepening our bilateral relations uh, through these um, the, uh, events and also um, the, our bilateral relations um, could not be uh, better uh, now, but uh, still I uh, continue to work on most uh, global issues like climate change or the women empowerment um, in cooperation with the Holy See. In, in Korea, Christianity, uh, Christians, also Catholics, are a minority. Um, can you describe a little bit the, the, the situation of, of, of Catholics in your country? Um, well, I don't know whether it, it can, we can call it a minority. We are the third uh, largest uh, religious community and it accounts for 11% of the entire population, over uh, 5.9 million um, Catholic community. But um, the, I think the Korean Catholic Church is uh, proud of having a very unique um, history of introducing Catholicism into Korea. And um, with the, the suffering and sacrifice in, in the persecutions. So they are very proud uh, of it. And then, um, the, although the, um, the Catholic community uh, is not increased uh, uh, in the, at the moment, maybe because of the, the COVID 19, um, there are still a lot of Korean. Uh, uh, Catholic community uh, who uh, want to have uh, the very strong bilateral relations with the Vatican. So what will you bring back home uh, from your encounters here also maybe with the Holy Father to the to the Catholics in Korea? Mm -hmm. um, in my uh, meeting with the Holy Father he um, emphasized the, the role of the women ambassadors especially in this diplomatic corps and um, he noted that um, the number of the women ambassadors accredited ambassador uh, to the Holy See is increasing and uh, he spoke highly of the um, the very performance good performance of the women ambassadors so I could feel the his genuine interest in the empowerment of, of women. So I think that uh, that's the one of the messages that we can, I would like to share with the, the Catholic community in Korea. Your Excellency, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for taking the time also for being with us. Welcome to Rome and I hope that we'll have many more conversations also in the future. And I wish you all the best also for your very important work here towards the Holy See. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us here in Rome. Andreas Townhauser, EWTN News Nightly. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.